As everybody knows, South Carolina is a, is a paradise, and people from all over the world have discovered us, <clears throat> and they're coming here to risk investments of billions of dollars that people are retiring here. <clears throat> everybody knows and understands the great beauty and peacefulness and wonderful people that we have here in South Carolina. But as you know, in recent, recent years, we've had some hurricanes, and they have wrought great destruction, some more than others. There have been deaths involved, and it has disrupted our growth but, and happiness and security. But taking all those things into consideration, according to the statistics, uh, there's a silent hurricane going on in our state that has hit us. And it's getting worse and it hits us every year. It's called the opioid crisis. And you don't read about it much because the news tends to focus on other things. But just to look at the statistics, you will see that it is quite alarming. And many of the people in this room now have had face-to-face -face dramatic experience with this crisis. In South Carolina, opioid-related deaths increased 21% from 2014 to 2016. In the last three years in South Carolina, opioid-related overdose deaths have outpaced, have outpaced homicides and drunk driving deaths by nearly double. In 2016, South Carolina saw 366 murders and 331 drunk driving deaths. In that same time, opioid related overdoses, 616 deaths. So you see the tremendous scale and can you imagine the tremendous suffering and misery and dislocation that comes from that. So we have concluded that it is time to take a dramatic step to engage all the resources that the state has, including that of public awareness and public opinion, to address this crisis. So I have today declared a statewide public health emergency for the state of South Carolina effective immediately and remaining in effect until revocation by subsequent executive order. This designation allows me to bring the full power of the state's emergency management infrastructure, health care apparatus, and law enforcement resources to bear in responding to the growing epidemic of op opioid deaths, <clears throat> addiction, and abuse to facilitate the effective coordination of federal, state, and local resources. This executive order, the first one, establishes the Opioid Emergency Response Team, led by State Law Enforcement Division Mark Keels, Chief Mark Keels, and Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, Director Sarah Goldsby. I've directed the Adjutant General, Robert Livingston, to utilize the emergency management infrastructure of this state to have all hands on deck to combat this crisis. I've also issued an executive order today directing the State Department of Health and Human Services to limit opioid prescriptions for acute and post-operative pain to a maximum of five days for the state Medicare recipients in that system. Also, at my request, the State Public Employee Benefit Authority has agreed to enact similar limits for participants in the state health plan. Additionally, I've asked the General Assembly to pass legislation making the five-day limitation state law for all opioid prescriptions. The Opioid Emergency Response Team will consist of representatives from state and federal law enforcement agencies, state health and regulatory agencies, health care treatment providers, and other stakeholders. 
utilizing a team collaborative approach. The opioid emergency response team will hold bi-monthly meetings at the State Emergency Management Division, that's where we are now, to assess the outcomes, evaluate new information, and develop further strategic plans. The first meeting will be held today, December 19th, uh, excuse me, this afternoon at 2.30. This is a bold new approach to an unprecedented problem. And this is the only way that we'll get our hands on this problem. There's a lot of talent in our agencies, in law enforcement, in the medical field, and a collaborative approach is the only thing that will work to something this big, and something this pernicious, something this insidious. And so the team members so far, and they, there will be others added later, are the following. South Carolina Emergency Management Division, Health and Human Services, Late Labor Licensing and Regulation, DHEC, the South Carolina Commission on Prosecution Coordination, Department of Public Service, the Adjutant General, of course, Major General, uh, General Livingston, Robert Livingston, local law enforcement, that would be Chief Skip Holbrook in the City of the Columbia, representatives from Blue Cross Blue Shield that handles the state health plan, the South Carolina Coroner's Association, South Carolina of, um, Chapter of American Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence, the South Carolina Behavioral Health Services Association, and the South Carolina American College of Emergency Physicians. We've had experience with this a, a long time ago in the area of collaboration and cooperation, uh, at, as for me, the others here have had similar experiences but back in the 80s, we knew we had a drug problem and nobody could get a handle on it. So we put together a team that consisted of the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, DEA, Customs, Customs Patrol, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and SLED. It was named by a newspaper reporter as Operation Jackpot. And we went out <coughs> using new approaches, new ideas, with no limits on the approach that we took to it. And that great group ended up getting evidence of an enormous drug rings that no one knew existed and ended up with over 100 prosecutions and convictions. So we have seen then, we have seen subsequently, collaboration, coordination, putting all the talent together with no limits on the way to devise new ideas, new approaches in order to assess, analyze, and stop a problem, and that's our that's our goal. And with the talent that we have in this room and in our agencies and among the people of South Carolina, we are, we are confident that we will have success. So with that, uh, you see we have a lot of people here today that uh, have their own views and talents and experiences to bring with, to this. And I would like to recognize at this time Sarah Goldsby, Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse. Sarah? Thank you, Governor. Welcome. As you pointed out with some of the data, we know that we haven't yet reached the peak of the opioid crisis, not only in our nation, uh, but in South Carolina. Uh, in the last year, we've seen the sharpest ever spike in deaths related to fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. So we're not out of the woods yet. And uh, with the most deadly drugs uh, in, in in our communities reaching those who have the need uh, with one of the most challenging diseases, opioid use disorder, uh, the need for continued collaboration is clear. The consequences of this opioid crisis really run deep and wide with devastating changes to family trees, uh, with impact on the health of our citizens and the impact on our workforce. If we weren't being vigilant, the ripple effects of this public health crisis might go overlooked and have a long-lasting effect on our state, like the rising rates of infectious disease among our young people misusing opioids and the number of kiddos who won't be raised by their own parents because they've fallen victim to untreated addiction. Our response remains urgent in the need for interventions. Uh, we need to be preventing more deaths, but this must also be ongoing, as you point out, while we prevent new cases of addiction 
while we get more people to treatment and while we evolve as a state to embrace more and more people in recovery. The new limit on prescriptions for acute and post-op pain will be a huge gain for us in preventing new cases of physical dependency and addiction to prescription drugs, which has really fueled this issue. And it's important to note that we have been doing some very good work uh, with our incredible staff at DEOTAS and fantastic partners across the state who have been working diligently and with innovation not only to save lives, but to enhance our systems in our community for prevention and to usher more uh, and more individuals to recovery. We currently have over 20 initiatives with over 60 partners across the state uh, targeting this issue. One example of cross-sector success is with our pilot to initiate treatment for opioid use disorder in emergency departments. And this was with suggestion from our legislature DEOTAS, DHHS, MUSC, and our local hospitals and local treatment providers are implementing a new evidence-based approach to stabilizing individuals in emergency rooms and getting them uh, with coordination to outpatient treatment. Um, and this is really, you know, for immediate help and ongoing help for our citizens, but as a cost saving to our health systems as well. Also, with the award of a federal grant uh, and with help from DHEC, and our local treatment providers and all of our local law enforcement, we've really been able to increase access to the overdose antidote naloxone uh, among our law enforcement officers, community members, and caregivers who are trained and equipped to uh, dispense or to uh, implement this drug. To date, we have had more than 4,100 law enforcement officers across 127 agencies in all counties. Um, implement this drug and, and that has led to what we believe is 149 lives saved uh, with, with this intervention. Governor, you have made it clear that even one life lost to addiction is one life too many. And the number of families in our state who are suffering because of this disease is truly unacceptable. You've made that clear and I just wanna thank you for your leadership and for your commitment to addressing this as a public health emergency. Um, and thank you truly for entrusting us all with this great responsibility of a strategic response. We know that we have more work to do and we know that this cross-sector collaboration that you point out is so key to comprehensively addressing the issue and the related consequences. The studies and the observations uh, have been done, they're being done, but a strategic coordinated action and monitoring of the situation and our progress is what we need now. We have a great number of assets to do this, as you point out, and we're building on them so that we will succeed. First, we have a spirit of cooperation, and this is what has made us successful already. We're a tight-knit state that works together for solutions. And additionally, we're more prepared for this emergency response in some ways than other states have been because we've got a well-established, publicly funded treatment system that has been growing to meet the needs of the opioid uh, issue with individuals in our state. And we have a good number of opioid treatment programs and those programs that uh, administer methadone with treatment uh, are very important because that has for more than 30 years uh, been proven to be effective in treating people with severe opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. So we've already been working to enhance our systems so that they can better address anyone with any addiction and we're primed to expand on that. Um, but perhaps our most important asset is hope and uh, that's hope that we can turn things around in South Carolina. Governor, you have shared that hope with us today and we can now share that with every person, every family, and every community uh, working to overcome the challenges of opioids and other addictions too. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> and also, the, one of the oldest rules in law enforcement is if you see something, say something, and say it quickly. And uh, that is an important part of this. If you can imagine, if every citizen considered themselves deputized, to sound the alert, to sound the alarm when they saw something. Imagine, imagine what we could do. Well, that's what we're asking every, every man, woman, and child in South Carolina to do today. And the, the tip of that spear, of course, would be the, would be the state law enforcement division and Chief Mark Keel. Chief. Thank you. 
I first want to thank uh, the ch sheriffs and chiefs, uh, our state and federal partners that are here today, along with our representatives from the state's prosecutors. I appreciate uh, y'all being here. They're always here to support us in, in efforts like this, and so I want to make sure and, and thank them. The governor's executive order proclaiming a public health emergency and establishment of an opioid emergency response team is a proactive step in combating this growing epidemic. Let's be clear, this is far more than a public health issue in our state. One agency or organization on its own cannot bring about all the positive change that can successfully address the issues of prescription drug abuse and the use of illegal drugs such as heroin and fentanyl. That's why it's important to understand that this is a public safety issue that requires coordination and collaborations from many disciplines to achieve the success that South Carolinians deserve. We in law enforcement and public safety see the consequences of drug abuse daily. First responders throughout our state have used naloxone to revive overdose victims, sometimes having to minister multiple doses to save people's lives. Since 2015, the State Law Enforcement Division Laboratory has seen a 650% increase in the number of drug cases in our state involving fentanyl-related compounds, which are being found in combination with other drugs, such as heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, and marijuana. Fentanyl is so deadly that even ingesting a few grains can be fatal. I'm honored to be part of this leadership of the Opioid Emergency Response Team, and I strongly believe in the power of partnerships and what can be done by working together. To reach the goals we want in our state calls for us to come together with the expertise each of the respective agencies and organizations possessed to bring about changes needed to eliminate the threat to our society. We want each South Carolinian to be a partner in this process as well. I would encourage you to talk to your health care provider about the need for and proper use of prescription drugs. Learn everything you can about this topic and share that with your family, your friends, and your community. The opioid epidemic in South Carolina and our nation can and must be defeated. By working together and taking advantage of the expertise of those who will be coming to the table in the next few months, we can make South Carolina's opioid epidemic a thing of the past. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> I'd like to recognize now Representative Eric Bedenfield, who has yet another perspective on this. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you guys here today. Um, the House Opioid Abuse Prevention Study Committee has pretty much wrapped up its, uh, its work and is in, in the process of developing its final report to be presented to the General Assembly in early January, uh, many of the measures that the governor spoke of here today and, and Sarah Goldsby spoke of today will be addressed in that report with recommendations from a legislative standpoint and from a budgetary standpoint. Um, the one piece of this puzzle that I hope to be able to bring to the table beyond that report is us not losing the humanitarian aspect of what we're here to talk about today. Um, my family is just one of the 600 some odd families in South Carolina who lost loved ones as a result of this epidemic. These people um, who find themselves addicted to this medication and even the illegal drugs are not morally corrupt individuals. These are people who have a disease and who need help. Um, they need assistance. Their brains and their bodies have been modified by the use of this medication and illegal drugs. And what they seek is help. What they seek is relief. And every additional attempt to use is a way to pacify their own bodies and calm themselves. Obviously, the activities, some criminal, some other, uh, that happen as a result of this use uh, are, are dangerous and create even more havoc within our society. But the truth of the matter is these are people who need help. Um, we have got to remove the stigma, 
surrounded by addiction, specifically um, opioid um, addiction, um, and let these people understand that we're here for them, we're here to help them, we want to create and foster an environment that, that helps them and creates a pathway forward for these folks to be productive members of our society, um, productive members of their family, good fathers, good mothers, good grandparents, good children, um, and we can do that. Um, but we can't do that by just demonizing the issue to begin with. I'm very grateful for every opportunity that's been presented to me and to the General Assembly to be a part of finding solutions to this problem. I'm grateful to the governor. I'm grateful to Sarah Goldsby. I'm grateful to Chief Keel. We do have to recognize this is a very holistic problem, and we have to find ways to uh, create answers from educating children about these dangers to the law enforcement aspects and putting people in jail who are peddling this stuff on the street. Um, my son had been clean for two years and three months when he relapsed. Relapse is not uncommon when we are looking at this particular drug, sometimes six, seven, eight, nine times before they ever find that final piece of help. Um, so you're never really out of the woods, um, and therefore you gotta continue to be working your sobriety in this area, and uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> As been uh, mentioned, this is gonna require, <clears throat> excuse me, dedication, and a, a, a real structure and a way to move all these assets forward uh, together in order to maximize the strength. And again, we will be seeking and depending on public input, ideas, and information all along the way. But part of the structure will be that of the South Carolina National Guard. And we're, we're grateful to have the finest National Guard in the, in the United States here in South Carolina. General Evans. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for taking this unprecedented step uh, to uh, declare the emergency and also to assemble this team. And I think you've got the right people. Uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, the Governor talks about interagency approach. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what a very uh, powerful uh, delivery about really what this epidemic is all about. And uh, it, as Chairman talked about, as, as Chief and uh, uh, the Director talked, uh, it is a team approach, and we, uh, in South Carolina, we, look, we finally refer to ourselves, and we're talking about all of South Carolina, not just the people behind me, uh, not just the uh, emergency management people, but everyone in South Carolina is part of Team South Carolina. And it's going to take that team approach. It, it's going to take uh, many different ways of approaching it. There's a law enforcement end where uh, you have people that are profiting from this, uh, these addictions. You have the treatment in from those who are physically addicted, but you also have that support piece. One thing that we have found in, in the military uh, is a wellness program uh, works very well in conjunction with other efforts to uh, help in uh, drug addictions. So we're gonna be bringing people from throughout the state, all of Team South Carolina, uh, the local agencies, the uh, local governments and the people of South Carolina. So, uh, Governor, thank you so much for what you're doing here. Team South Carolina is ready to respond. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I'm unclear. What is the guard's uh, role in this? We surely aren't going to have guards in the hospitals. Well, we need to we need to have a structure, and the National Guard, of course, is statewide, and the uh, the intelligence they can provide as well as as the the, the information and the, the the structure if if we need uh, the the type of, of interdictive help that the National Guard can provide but but the, I guess the main point is to to demonstrate and bring together all the assets that we have in the state and as you know in hurricanes and other other such uh, natural disasters the, the National Guard is right at the top and so that uh, the information they gather, the structure they bring, the insights they have are, are, are vastly important to this kind of an effort. Good. Yes, sir. 
Uh, so many times uh, people confuse uh, South Carolina National Guard with just the war fighting capability or maybe the supplement uh, that we perform during hurricanes and things. We actually encompass the emergency management piece too. And so it's, it's the Office of the Adjutant General uh, that will be involved in the uh, emergency management under Kim Stenson, Director Stenson. Uh, will be helping to coordinate this effort and also bring a little bit different uh, thought process to it. Uh, what we don't want to do is to just take the traditional agencies. We want to get all agencies involved. So as a, we'll be working mainly a coordination piece. And as the governor talked, uh, we currently work with SLED quite closely with uh, Intel Fusion. And also this, is, this building that we're in is where we'll be having the meetings. And another thing is in these, these kind of endeavors, of what we don't know is what we're seeking to learn, to find out the true dimensions of this problem, of this vicious problem. So the, the insights of a variety of institutions and people is, is required. Any other questions? Governor, I think most people understand the limitation on post-op uh, opioid prescriptions, but uh, do you think there could be some un unintended consequences as a result of that policy? People for example, suffering chronic pain uh, and, and, and other unintended consequences? Well, there, there could be, but we know what the consequences right now of opioid addiction are, and there's no reason, there's no excuse not to bring all the power we have to bear on this problem right now. As you noticed, the executive order covers the first five days of the prescriptions that are, that, that are issued. It, we, we will be able to determine, and that is the, the, that is the time during which we understand from medical and scientific evidence that the addiction can occur, it's the first five days. So if a physician may issue a, a prescription for one pill a day for some people and more than that for, for others, depending on the type of operation, the type of injury, the type of pain, but we will be able to analyze the results of this. It will be certainly brought full score to the physicians issuing those prescriptions when that person uh, comes back and we'll be able to calibrate and adjust that uh, limitation as we go forward. But there's, there's, the worst thing we can do right now is, is, uh, is hesitate. And we're not going to hesitate. We're going full blast into this as a, as a full team. Follow up on that, five days, how does that compare Great. <clears throat> We've heard, had information. I'll let, let Sarah address this as well. But some people walk out of the out of the hospital, out of the doctor's office with a pill with 60 or 90, 90 pills in one prescription. And they don't need that many. And we've had countless reports. And that right there, they're carrying around <clears throat> a, a potential addiction right there for somebody, whether it's a child that goes into the, into the medicine cabinet, somebody who steals the pills, or if you have an unscrupulous person, perhaps they'll sell those pills because there's a high market value to those things. So we've got to we've got to cut that down. People should not be should not get more of those pills. Just just think of each each one is deadly to somebody else, or perhaps to that person as well. We have to be sure that those pills don't get on the don't get out of, uh, on the market. Sir, would you like to? Please? Governor, you said it well. Uh, what we know is there's a high amount of diversion when patients are leaving an, an acute care facility um, with that, that many pills. And um, I think you paraphrased it perfectly. We, we've got to clamp down on this, uh, knowing that patients with acute issues and operative issues are going to have follow-up with a prescriber who may prescribe more if they need it. But uh, what we certainly don't want is those patients leaving with 60 to 90 days of pills and able to divert. More. Tell, tell them what an acute issue is. So we're talking about anything that would bring you to an emergency department, something that's broken, something, um, some kind of accident that is not chronic ongoing um, causing you pain, but that's very short term. Uh, so short term pain requires short term <coughs> prescriptions, and I think that's what we're getting at here. So you imagine you, you really need, say you broke your arm or something, you have bad pain, but it'll go away in just a few days, but you walk out with three months worth of, worth of pills, what do you do with them? Do you throw them in a trash can? Do you, you shouldn't flush them down the commode <coughs> into that system. What do, what do you do with those things? And that's, it just opens the door to abuse. It's, it's like poison. Uh, sitting out there on, on your mailbox for somebody to pick up.
Governor, is any of this inspired by or directed from the White House? Because we know the president uh, wanted to declare a public health crisis, but not a national emergency. So it seems like you've kind of taken the next step that President Trump didn't necessarily. Well, I think that we have had recognition of this danger all over the country. I know there are several other governors have, who have taken steps. Of course, we applaud the president for, for his initiative and his, his insight. Uh, I imagine that in, in time, and we're hoping a very short time, that others around the country will see what we're doing here in South Carolina and may, may see some opportunities, ideas there for them. As I say very often and even today, we're always looking for ideas and looking for information. And we hope that, that what we're doing today with this, this full team collaborative approach will engender some ideas for, for other people as well. Because see, some of these pills come from out of state. There, I mean, there's no, there's no limit to the destruction and, and the many aspects of this problem. This is a very dangerous drug. It can come from anywhere. How would you measure success? Is there a metric? One, one, one way to measure it would be simply by the deaths, but there's, there's no way to measure the destruction or the impact that this kind of poison has on a community or on a state. Sarah? I think you started with the most important factor, which is our mortality. We should be aiming to have zero mortality related to opioid overdose. Not one person uh, should be lost to this crisis. Um, and we can measure success in any number of ways, especially with addiction. We want to get those people who aren't working back to work. We want those people um, who have lost their children um, to get their children back. We want them to be finding fulfillment and productive members of society. Um, and so that's our aim. And we'll be listening to our communities and our families as they tell us and watching the data that we look at as indicators. And see, this, this kind of this kind of threat manifests itself or has repercussions all over the place. It hurts education, it hurts economic growth. When workers can't continue to work, when people, uh, uh, investors are thinking of coming to South Carolina, or expanding when they, they believe that, that the opioid uh, crisis in South Carolina is worse than other places and that will inhibit possibly in, inhibit growth, it's, it, it has ramifications and impacts throughout society. I had a question for the uh, acting director of DHEC, David Wilson, specifically about <coughs> the uh, strengthened law that the legislature passed last year when it came to prescription drug monitoring and making it mandatory. Have we seen any benefit of that be coming, coming on the books this past year since you've been on there? Uh, Thank you, and, and yes, we have. Uh, as a matter of fact, an example is uh, this past June, we had a record number of uh, prescribers uh, accessing uh, our prescription monitoring program, almost 1.4 million. So we have, it's, it's a huge increase, so we have definitely seen a benefit from that ball going into effect. Other questions? So we know that nothing's done uh, without, without money. How much funding does this add and get rid of doesn't add a penny. This is collaboration and cooperation. There's no money involved in this at all. Now, there may be aspects of this program that, that uh, develop into uh, uh, being quite successful, and perhaps we'll want to find some uh, budgetary uh, impact. We might want to put some money into it. But, but right now, th this, the point is that this, we, we have all these agencies, we have all this talent, and now we have this, this idea. None of that costs any money. And <clears throat> we have seen it through collaboration and cooperation of the public sector and the private sector with a good idea. We can make great progress without spending any more money. And we believe that this will have enormous impact. We've been collaborating and cooperating to some extent for, for some number of years, but this, this takes it to, uh, into a, uh, an area that we have not done before on, uh, as far as this crisis. We're going to go wherever we can. And that's why we have this full team. If 
you have the full team, then on that team, somebody knows the best place to go, the best place to start. That's been it. That's been, as I mentioned, Operation Jackpot. That's what we learned back then. And it's been learned in other places where we use collaboration and cooperation. That there's, if you have the full team together, if you have everyone that knows a part of a problem, then you can see that problem in its full dimension and someone will have an answer or an idea. How often will you meet, and you mentioned you already collaborate now. How By monthly. How many, how many agencies does this expand in terms of what you're already doing? This makes it official and also does add some, some permanent partners. This is, this is larger than what we've done before, but it is an official structure that will meet regularly and will I believe we all here, uh, speaking for the whole group, believe that this is the way to conquer this problem, this crisis. In fact, it's the only way. There is no other way. And as I mentioned before, part of this is getting the public participa participation of citizens out there, uh, churches, synagogues, any kind of institution, rotary clubs, uh, of course, all your, your medical that everyone in the medical field, doctors, nurses, everyone, pharmacists, everyone needs to be alert and aware to the danger that the overprescription and the use of these of this substance causes everyone. This is something we can't close our eyes to. It's not happening to somebody else. As Chairman Beddingfield, Beddingfield pointed out, it can, it can happen to anyone. You can back into it accidentally. You go to the hospital, get too many pills, or and you, you take them, and then you keep taking them. And yeah, I mean, this is a record-setting addiction. Just in about five days, you can be hooked. And from then on, even if you get unhooked, you, you fall back into it. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And there's no telling how much it's cost in this state, this society, not only in pain, misery, and lost opportunity, but in actual, actual dollars. Chief Kiel, I know law enforcement, even here in the Midlands, has things like drug take back days, that kind of thing, where you can come and bring in your unused medications and that kind of thing. Right. Is there any other kind of initiative or something that's going to be able to come to come to bear now that you guys have this official cooperation that you guys have already started talking about? Well, I would just say this, you know, we, we uh, <coughs> law enforcement in South Carolina is, is very fortunate that we uh, have very close relationships and partnerships, and we do collaborate every day, and we will continue that effort, both with our state and local partners and our federal partners using the state grand jury uh, for multiple jurisdictions uh, where crimes are going on and also our federal uh, grand jury and DEA uh, that we partner with already. And so we will, we will make extra effort in these cases. We'll uh, step up our interdiction efforts that we have and uh, do everything we can to, to look at the illegal side of this uh, that we see with the fentanyls and heroin and, and illegal drugs that we have coming into our state. I guess my main question then also is because we know it's it's a thing where it can just be somebody gets that prescription and then they just keep taking the pills because they feel better. I mean, is there anything from you guys' side that that you're going to handle on that end, or will that be more of the health and human services? Side? That will be more the the you know drug abuse treatment and the health human services side. Will anybody that you guys end up arresting be kind of directed toward that? Is that one? Well, certainly. I mean, certainly they would, and certainly we would. You know, I can tell you today, law enforcement uh, tries to uh, direct folks that we know are abusing those drugs today to, to services that will help them uh, get out of that, uh, you know, that addiction that they're in. So, I mean, that's an ongoing thing today. That's not something new that we will continue to do that. Further questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>